So, I adopted my children, and now I have a baby mama and a baby daddy and a baby grandma and a baby uncle. The whole reason I adopted in the first place was so I didn't have a deadbeat dad, not paying child support, breaking my baby's heart when he didn't show up for his weekend, fighting with me over the phone, and otherwise adding stress to my life and my beautiful child's life. And now I have an entire baby family. I could have paid for a sperm donor. I could have had hot sex with one of the many men out there who so easily get caught up in the moment of heavy breathing and a flash of skin that they don't even want to take two seconds to dig out the condom they have in their wallet. I could have put even more money on my credit cards and adopted internationally and had a baby family that was thousands of miles away and probably too poor to ever make it to America. I could have adopted through a local agency and made sure it was a closed adoption with no contact between families and completely sealed records until my baby turned 18. Believe me, I thought of all those options, especially the one about having hot sex. But then I would be missing out on the two smartest, most beautiful children in the world, my own, my son Tyler, who is now 10, and my daughter Madison, who is now 8. The first time I met my baby mama, we were at a McDonald's with two social workers, some fries, and some burgers. We waited and ate, ate and waited, while I told a one-year-old and a three-year-old who had just been ripped from their basement apartment a few weeks ago by the police, maybe your mom is stuck in traffic. To which my three-year-old replied, oh yeah, her car probably broke down. That happened all the time. Social services allows one, week per, one hour per week for children to meet with their biological parents while they are in foster care. And our time was almost up when my baby mama and her boyfriend strolled in. Or should I say wobbled or jerked or whatever word you use for the way a crackhead walks. They sat down at the booth with tears, or maybe those eyes were what you call glassed over, and their knees bounced and their mouths twitched and they hugged all over my new babies and I hated them. I sat there so still with real tears for the babies I'd only had a few weeks, next to the social workers who were already working on their notes, and I put on a happy face and I made excuses for my baby mama so that my babies didn't feel unwanted or unloved. And then I began to grow some hate in my heart for the baby mama I never even thought I could have and the baby daddy who already didn't show for his first visit. As the ebb and flow of hate goes, my hate is beginning to ebb. That is, if to ebb means to be healed with the help of God. It has been seven years, five months, and 12 days since my babies first walked into my home. That first day they came to me with one bag consisting of a comb, a new shirt, and the really stinky clothes they had on. My daughter had some tight braids in her baby fine hair that made her head look bald, her cute little baby pudgy face look bloated, and my son cried and cried until I sat him in front of Spongebob, the only cartoon I knew about back then. On that first day after the social worker left, my neighbors came over and we began taking out braids, giving baths, and giving hugs. That night began a series of nights that lasted for about six months where I would awaken to a little boy standing next to my bed staring at me. He wouldn't say anything, so with heart racing I would say, are you okay? Are you scared? Are you hot? Are you sick? Did you have a bad dream? Do you have to go to the bathroom? He still wouldn't say anything, but his little feet would pad back to his bed and he would go back to sleep. A few hours later, he would appear again, little boy by my bed, silent. My questioning, then the quick walk back to his room. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what he wanted, and I was sick of being awakened three times a night. I would lie there and toss and turn and wonder what I had gotten myself into until one night, six months later, I finally learned to say what he needed. It was something simple, something easy, but something so profound. It was, I'm here, baby, and I'm not going anywhere. Eventually, my baby slept through the night. From these nightly episodes, I started to put the pieces together about the first three and a half years of his life and the first year and a half of his sister's life. I can change her diaper, he would say. I do it all the time. He would also say, are you going to steal that or buy it? And one time, my dad got so mad, he made my nose bloody. And daily, he would ask me, are you coming home? I learned from a trip to Petco while standing by the yellow cans of dog food that my baby mama and my baby daddy used to put formula under my baby's coat and have him take it out of the store without pain. They don't search three-year-olds, you know. I learned from checking on him at night when he, that he didn't like to sleep in his bed, When I asked him why, he told me, when I stayed in the hotel with my mom and her boyfriend, I slept on the floor. And I learned from chasing him around the kitchen table repeatedly and pulling him out from under the coffee table when it was time to go somewhere that he felt the need to hide and to run from somebody. 
After a short while, he learned that we pay for our groceries, even when money is tight. He knows it's too drafty to sleep on the floor, and he likes to make himself a nest in his bed. And when I say it's time to go, he's ready. Over the years, we have made tremendous progress, but I have to be honest, it's hard to be a parent. It's hard to be a single parent, and it's hard to raise two children who have been through so much in their short little lives. The days of wishing I'd tried route number two, hot sex in the night with no condom, <laughs> which would have given me at least a chance of a semi-decent baby daddy, are high in number and a source of many daydreams. Oh God, these are some of the most diff difficult years I have ever experienced. I wish I had someone to rely on, someone to talk to about all the many decisions, big and small, that I have to make on a daily basis and which will affect the lives of my children, perhaps well into adulthood. I wish I had a husband whose care and concern for our children matched that of my own. I wish I had someone to go to the movies with or laugh with me at the funny things that my babies say, and goodness, I wish I had someone to help me figure out what to say. But I know that I do, because when I wake in the middle of the night, scared and unsure of how to be a good mom, and how to heal all the wounds that have cut my baby so deep. I pad to my own Heavenly Father's bed, and I realize as he whispers softly to me that I knew what to say to my son all along. I'm here, baby, and I'm not going anywhere.